All right, let's get started. Let's uh, have our our newly elected uh, um, third vice president from Miami, Florida, Mr. Danny Felton is going to welcome us. Mr. Felton. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the 73rd annual convention. And uh, this morning's panel, uh, my name is Danny Felton, the third vice president of the National Association of Real, Real, Real Estate Brokers. And I want to say good morning, realtists. You know, good morning, realtists. Uh, we have a action-packed panel this morning. Uh, we're going to discuss fair housing, uh, combating bias in Houston, I mean, in housing, uh, as well as real estate and lending. So it's, we have a very informative panel this morning and I'm not gonna belabor the point, but I'm gonna move right along and ask our uh, chaplain, uh, Ms. Linda Chambers, uh, if she would please lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you. Good morning, NARAB. Season greetings. Let us all pray. Lord, we open our hearts in your name we pray N-A-R-E-B stands in your name's sake. And it stands to the nation to provide the wealth to the country. Lord, bless our leaders, partners, sponsors, and members that we continue to be the servant in the communities. May our light show the vision with tools to help our community in this pandemic time. We love you, God, and we ask you Keep us focused and remember, we serve a great God. We ask you to heal all sick and this pandemic be over. We love you, we praise you in your name. We will continue to trust in you, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Madam Chambers. I really appreciate that prayer. Uh, prayer is always in order. Um, so I would like to, uh, secondly, next introduce our 31st uh, national president, Mr. Donnell Williams. Uh, he's going to come before us with his remarks. Mr. Williams. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Realtors. Good morning, friends. Thank you all for joining us on this panel. We call it the empowerment panel because this is uh, the second leg of the, the mantra that I developed here, education, empowerment, and mobilization. Okay, so that's what we're after. NAREB, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, is the premier. It is the, the first organization that was concerned about fair housing. Okay, so we are the leaders in this, in this field, and we want to continue to be leaders. Um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, our, uh, our, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers has a, a mantra called democracy and housing. Okay, so that, that further proves that we were concerned about fair housing. We want all people to be treated right. Black, white, yellow, brown, all people to be treated fairly, without discrimination, without harassment. So we continue to strive to meet those goals and to make sure that everyone is treated fairly. And I wanna thank this panel as we move forward uh, in partnership with all of them. So I wanna thank you all and thank you all for tuning in. The Northeast, I mean, as you know, I'm in the Northeast, we had a bit of a snowstorm. so I, I am not available all. to be with you all. So thank you. As you know, I'm in the Northeast. We had a bit of a snowstorm. So I, I am not available to be with you all. I tried to send it to you. I don't know your password. I mean, your email. It popped back. I don't know your password. No, I want you to tell me right now. I'm going because I got to. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator. Take control of that, Mr. Moderator. All right, Ms. Ruby, you need to mute yourself, please. Well, I'm sorry. No. All righty, I think we got some background noise or something. All right, so we're going to go back to um, Mr. Uh, Danny Felton. You have any final remarks? No, I just want, I don't want to hold the show, but I think we, uh, I'm excited to hear our panelists today. We got some very exciting panelists because it's going to give us some very uh, interesting information, and I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, Mr. Thompson, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you. We appreciate all of your hard work. Uh, first, I'd like to um, thank you uh, as our new uh, third vice president. We wish we were in Florida right now. I know it's warmer than it is up here in uh, the DMV as we affectionately call it. 
uh, but keep up the great work. We also want to thank uh, our 31st president, Mr. Donnell Williams, who is battling that snow in Jersey uh, as well. Next, we'd like to uh, introduce uh, C. Renee Wilson. Uh, I know that she's in a warm climate in Houston, Texas. Good to see you as well. She's going to introduce our relationship manager. He's going to introduce many of our sponsors for today. Good morning, Ms. Wilson. Good morning. Thank you so very much. Um, we've been having an extremely exciting time, so I'm sure you guys have learned a lot. So I want it's my turn to talk about our power partner pause. Uh, so some of you may not have heard some of the other partners, so welcome back to those who have and welcome to those who have not. We do the power partner pause. Is there anything we can do about the Ruby, Jill? Okay. Yes, um, we're having some feedback. I'm trying to identify who it's coming from. It's with Mr. Uh, Ed London, and I just put him on mute. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. Um, so the Power Partner Pause is created for a couple of reasons. One, it's an opportunity for us to take a moment to give gratitude to our partners. We want you guys to know that we genuinely appreciate all of your support, all of your input, all of the conversations, all of the time, and the work that you do in the communities where our local chapters are. So one, we want you to know we thoroughly, we truly appreciate all, everything that you do uh, in our quest to fulfill, the, to close the homeownership gap. The second reason to the Realtors members that we do this is so that our partners can share with you information that they want you to know. We are looking forward to 2021. So without further ado as well, I will first introduce a new partner to our table, um, Ms. Melissa Overton with Fifth Third Bank. And Melissa is the Vice President and CRA Mortgage Program Manager. Uh, and she's absolutely an amazing friend. So Melissa, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Renee. And thanks to the rest of the NARAB leadership and membership for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I am Melissa Overton, as Renee has said, CRA Mortgage Program Manager with Fifth Third Bank. And Fifth Third Bank is proud to be a supporter of your 73rd annual convention, where your important theme this year is to educate, to empower, and to mobilize. I commend you guys on leading the charge and for calling us all to action and closing the black home ownership gap, a gap that lacks the white home ownership gap by about 30%, a gap that uh, is larger today than it's been in over 50 years, and quite candidly, a gap that calls for uncomfortable conversations, immediate changes, and bold commitments, all of which we have been having here at Fifth Third Bank, all of which we have been doing, all of which have led to a recent commitment uh, to closing the, the racial wealth um, gap. Um, it's 2.8 billion, 2.8 billion to accelerate racial uh, equity, equality, and inclusion, uh, 2.2 billion of the 2.8 that we will uh, earmark to help small businesses uh, and, and black home ownership uh, to, to um, improve. As we all know, it's, it's a national crisis right now. Um, and part of that commitment, part of that 2.2 billion that we are hoping to do to help uh, home, black home ownership and businesses is to increase black home ownership by 31% over the next three years. So I look forward to future conversations with uh, your national and local leadership. Renee has been phenomenal to work with. She is absolutely awesome. So, you know, she's helped Fifth Third to navigate through to other uh, national local members, uh, to name a couple, Courtney over in Chicago, Miranda in Detroit, Monique over in Cleveland. So guys, let's do more. How do we begin those conversations where we can work together, we can build a more solid partnership where we can begin to be a part of the solution. So in closing, thanks again for this great opportunity. I wanna wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a blessed new year. And uh, 
enjoy the rest of the convention. So thanks again. Melissa, thank you. That was absolutely amazing. We appreciate you and I certainly look forward to continuing to grow the relationship in 2021. You're definitely positioned for that. So we look forward to that. Next, we have someone that has been around for a long time, new in her position, not brand new, but new in this position, but she has been in the industry for quite some time and a friend to NARAB. So I would like to introduce another friend, Dion Curlio with City, and she leads the diverse markets segment. So Dion, we'd love to hear from you. Hey, Renee. Good morning, Realtist. Uh, so as she said, my name is Dion Cuello, and I cover diverse market segments and all of the initiatives that is included within the trade organizations. Um, so it's with great pleasure pleasure to join you guys. Obviously, we did not anticipate it to be virtual, but I commend NAREB to keep the conversation going. Um, this year, without a doubt, has been some unprecedented times um, within our communities, but I will say um, City is committed to uh, ensuring programs like the two and five, democracy and housing, and building black wealth through um, home ownership continues to evolve and make an impact within the NAREB community. So NAREB, you have done a phenomenal job in making sure that the conversation continues. Um, hard act to follow, but I will say City and the City Foundation um, has announced and plans to spend um, right now $1 billion to close the racial equity gap. So with that, $550 million are, is to help support home ownership by people of color and affordable housing of minority developers, as well as $350 million um, in procurement opportunities for Black-owned black businesses suppliers. So in addition to products that City provides, like our home run product and LPA, um, we really look forward to the continued growth that City and NAREB work together to cultivate. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but I know that the continuance of your, um, you know, visionary leaders uh, will help close the home ownership gap and really pave the pathway for generational wealth to come. So thank you for having me here, and I look forward to uh, the rest of the convention. Thank you, Dion. Certainly appreciate uh, all of your hard work and the strategies and connecting in the local market to make a difference. We so appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, certainly, as I get my screen back, I'm not sure what happened. But last but not least, um, a long, long, long time friend of NARAB's. I am so happy to introduce Mr. Phil Bracken, who is the Managing Director, Government and Mortgage Industry relations at Vantage Score. Phil, it is so good to see you. We would love to hear what you have to update us on. You're, you're muted. Thank you, Renee, no. and thank you. Good morning, Realtist. Um, again, uh, I want to, by the way, first, um, I am the uh, probably the first to um, uh, have the uh, Dion Cuello um, designer glasses. Uh, any, everyone should get a pair. Um, let me just zip into this really fast. Um, appreciate uh, uh, NARAB giving us a chance to uh, describe why we are a proud sponsor and what we're doing to try to help change the paradigm um, of uh, the home ownership rate, et cetera. I might just mention that the Census Bureau uh, report just came out. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, net worth of homeowners is now 80 times greater than net worth of renters. Um, we've got to fix, uh, we've got to close the gap um, to improve the generational wealth in Black America. So Vantage Score has been trying for 14 years to get into the mainstream of the mortgage market uh, because we know we can score 40 million more people that can't get a score through uh, traditional uh, conventional scoring models. Of those, 10 million would be likely mortgage eligible uh, with a score of 620 and up, and 2.4 million or so of those would be Black and Hispanic borrowers. Um, we filed our application with um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in July, and we expect uh, this to, uh, in the middle of this next year to get our, our model approved. And we're so we're coming. We're coming to the mortgage market, and we're going to be bringing that um, open that opportunity um, for a wide sector of the Black population. Um, in addition to that, we um, recently um, improved our social responsibility initiatives by signing a partnership agreement um, 
to uh, provide uh, more resources for the historical, historically black colleges and universities. Um, our partnership is with uh, Home for USA, uh, and we are working really hard to uh, encourage a, a number of uh, other financial institutions to join with us in that partnership to expand uh, the opportunities uh, in uh, the HBCUs. And lastly, just might, might mention that um, for the past two years, I've been working, uh, we, Vantage Score, have been working every day to try, I know it's a big mission, but uh, it, it has to be done. We are trying to change the paradigm of how mortgages are produced in America. I've shown some snippets of this to uh, Mr. Thompson and uh, Lisa Rice and a few others. Uh, we By the end of this year, we will be done, uh, ready to go in the first part of next year to provide so that lenders um, and others can provide uh, a, a rather instant pre-qualification approval for consumers and uh, eventually an, a rather instant uh, uh, mortgage approval. And in addition, uh, a process that would include the ability to use rent, utility, and cell phone data in uh, the analysis for consumer capability. So we're coming. Uh, these changes are not easy, but they're, um, they're essential. They are strategic imperatives for America. We're proud to be a catalyst for this change. And um, uh, also, um, as all of you know, it is our mission to help uh, uh, improve the opportunity for, um, for black, uh, the black segment in America. And can't thank NARAB enough for all the hard work that you do to illuminate this and to drive this mission forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phil. That's um, news is very interesting. We appreciate everyone's time. Thank you all. And this, I will sign off. See Renee Wilson, Relationship Manager. I'll approve this message. This is the end of the Power Partner Pause. Back to you, Antoine. Thank you, thank you. We, we wanna thank you, Ms. Wilson, and we wanna thank our three uh, sponsors as well. We look forward to getting uh, more uh, resources from Vantage Score, some of those uh, billions of dollars, Dion, from uh, City Citibank, and of course, uh, Fifth Third as well, Melissa. I think Melissa may have, like, uh, she's still on, yeah. So we, we look forward to that, um, pushing a little harder, okay? We look forward to that. We're trying to rebuild America. Uh, build back better, as Biden says. So next, we're going to get right into the uh, panel um, so the panel will discuss the urgency to dismantle the discriminatory policies that foster and enable housing and lending discrimination in the United States. It will call for bold, courageous, and visionary leadership from the civic, faith, business, and elected leaders to close the home ownership gap between Blacks and white Americans. Uh, presently, a 76% of white ownership as of September 30th, according to the U.S. Census, compared to 46% for Black Americans. So we have a long way to go. Our panelists are very uh, distinguished individuals. Our first panelists, and I'm going to introduce them really quickly, then we're going to give them a, a minute or two uh, to uh, talk about fair housing from their perspective, some of the historic and current things, and then we'll get right into some questions. Lisa Rice, President and CEO, National Fair Housing Alliance, the force, the woman leading the charge all over the country. Lisa Rice is the President and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance, affectionately known as NAFA, the nation's only national civil rights agency solely dedicated to eliminating all forms of housing discrimination. Ms. Rice has 35 years of experience in fair housing and extensive experience and knowledge in the area of fair lending. She must be started this job when she was five years of age. Brian Green, Vice President of Fair Housing Policy, National Association of Realtors, Brian Green is Vice President of Policy at, the, at NAR, where he oversees all legislative, regulatory, advocacy on behalf of the association, 1. million members. He joined NAR in, in November 2019 and spent his first year raising the association's profile in Washington and nationwide around fair housing-related policy matters. 
and he's also their first director of fair housing policy. Next, we will hear from Dr. Edward, the Reverend Dr. I should say, I've always been God first. Reverend Dr. Edward C. London, National Historian and 22nd past president for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Dr. London is the founder and, and, and of AC London and Associates, a full service real estate property and facilities management and development firm in Atlanta, Georgia. He was elected president, national president in 2001 and currently serves as the national historian as the association counts down to its 75th anniversary uh, in a, just over a year. H. Bernie Jackson, national parliamentarian and 20th past president of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Bernie Jackson is the principal broker for BJR Associates and Five Star Realty, Realty Property Management and Real Estate Sales Companies located in Baltimore, Maryland. He's also, uh, he, Mr. Jackson was elected NARAB national president in 1997 and currently serves as the national parliamentarian. And he's also a, a go-to person as well for history of the association and a dynamic guy. Both of these gentlemen are really good in property management as well, as well. So, well, let's put our, I guess, give a, an association hand clap for all our panelists. All right, all right, virtual hand clap. All right, so we're gonna give each of the panelists uh, two to three quick minutes uh, to talk about briefly their uh, perspective on the, the historic challenges of, of fair housing and as we lead up to the 21st century, because we got a lot to talk about, about past, but also the stuff that's happening right now. So we're gonna start really quickly with Lisa Rice to kind of set the tone and then we'll, we'll, we'll go right to our next panel. So Lisa, you got two to three minutes, share with the folks. I know you're on the front line, suing people every day, uh, doing testing and, and, and keeping the feet to the fire. And, and the association is always a proud partner to, 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 to join in on some of these lawsuits around housing discrimination. Lisa Rice. Antoine, thank you so much for that uh, really warm uh, in, in, uh, introduction. I think I'm going to have you introduce me every single time I speak somewhere. <laughs> uh, but I am honored to be participating in this panel um, with this really esteemed audience um, and very, very particularly honored to be on the panel with Brian Green. Brian Green and I just recently have been named as co-chairs of the Racial um, Equity Committee for the, the Black Homeownership Collaborative, which is under the auspices of the National Housing Conference. And our goal there is to expand uh, housing opportunities for people of color, and in particular, um, focusing on this huge Black-white homeownership gap that folks have been talking about. NARAB is, uh, has always been a dear friend of fair housing. As uh, our president noted, NARAB is the first fair housing organization in the nation. And we so appreciate your partnership and support in advancing fair housing uh, opportunities throughout the nation. So let me just say very briefly, we, you know, we do a lot of talking about our uh, fair housing laws and uh, how important those fair housing laws are, and they indeed are. The challenge that we face, I think, uh, Antoine, is that those laws have never been fully enforced. In fact, the first fair housing law was passed during Reconstruction, right, 1866. And that fair housing law was hardly ever enforced. It was used twice in a 100 year span from 1866 to 1966. So one of the, the preeminent uh, challenges that we face is lack of enforcement of our fair housing laws. <clears throat> but the other challenge that we face is that we have a bevy of laws, literally thousands of laws that we have passed in this nation since before the inception of the nation 
to the present, and I am including the, the CARES Act in this number, we have a bevy of laws uh, that we have passed in the housing and lending space that have worked to really advance and provide opportunities and benefits to our white brothers and sisters while simultaneously closing off or denying opportunities for uh, people in communities of color. Some of those laws were in place to intentionally discriminate against communities of color and other laws like the CARES Act do so um, uh, more implicitly, but nevertheless, the result is still the same. And so we have structures of inequality. We have uh, systems, we have systematic driving of racial inequality when it comes to housing and lending access in the United States. Part and parcel of, of those structures of inequality are residential segregation and the dual credit market. Residential segregation is really the bedrock of all inequality in America. And you can look at any area of um, uh, disparity that you want to. You can look at health outcome disparities. You can look at lending outcome disparities. You can look at food access disparities. You can look at uh, environmental um, uh, disparities and link those to where people live. Where you live matters because it drives everything uh, about you. It determines what kinds of access you will have, um, what kinds of opportunities you will have access to simply based on where you live. So residential segregation and the dual credit market are really these structural uh, elements that are stubbornly uh, ha are persistent in our society that are driving all kinds of discriminatory outcomes. And that, that's not to say that we don't have intentional sort of individual discrimination like what we saw in the Newsday investigation. We definitely have that and we have to address that. But we also have to address the structures that are driving uh, discriminatory outcomes in our society. Thank you, thank you. I wanna go to um, all our speakers, if you can just make sure when you're not uh, speaking uh, for these next few minutes, if we can be on mute, because uh, when if you speak it, 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 the camera goes right to you. Uh, next, I wanna go to a couple of our Realtors presidents. Uh, first, I wanna go to H. Bernie Jackson. Uh, We've had a lot of conversations. He was on the uh, part of the 50th anniversary committee for the uh, Fair Housing Act. And so I'd like for you to kind of, Mr. Jackson, share with the folks, um, you know, your personal stories from the industry then and now, what's changed, what's not the same. And then we want to contextualize the role that this associate has played then and now. If you could just give us a couple minutes snapshot on that. that I, I know I gave you a lot to try to pack, to unpack there, thanks. Well, good morning all. Well, that, that question actually is a 20 minute uh, reply. But let me just, it, it's, HUD Housing and Urban Development was formed in 1965, its first, Commissioner was Mr. Robert Weaver, who worked closely with NARAD. In 1968, the Fair Housing Act was signed into law. But I would just like to make sure that we all know the reason why it was signed into law. In 1966, Dr. King started this legislation as on his trip to Chicago to enforce fair housing discrimination. At that point, that legislation was put before Congress. So for so two years, it stayed there and it was not coming out until the assassination of Dr. King in April, of 9, April 4th, 1968. Otherwise, there would not have been a Fair Housing Act. There was trade association that fought this legislation to the nails. So without the death of Dr. King, no Fair Housing Act. But we, 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 we go 50 years from there to 19 to 2018, and not much has changed. 
As we know, discrimination exists then and discrimination exists today. It's, it's unfortunate. We, we now look at what has happened more recently with President Donald Trump. Unfortunately, he brings in a housing commissioner with no housing experience whatsoever. And that's Honorable Dr. Carson from my home state, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Dr. Carson uh, terminates 2015 affirmative uh, rule that, of course, President Obama put in place. It, it is a sad situation that we had to deal with the last four years with a commissioner who didn't even understand what Section 8 was. But here we are today. We, we do have an opportunity to bring forth changes. Uh, just to let you know that we have, over the, over the years, we've signed uh, voluntary marketing agreements with, with HUD. We've signed one American marketing agreement with HUD. We have all those tools in place. If you are a member of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, there's no re requirement that you have to sign any other fair marketing agreement with any other trade association. So we have all those tools readily available to you. And there's a copy of our voluntary marketing agreement that we had. And, and just to let you know, just to try to summarize, if, if we're gonna teach our own members what discrimination is, then we cannot let other people teach it for us. We have to teach it ourselves to our own members. The crime is trying to let someone else tell your story. It's not gonna work. And with that, again, try to make sure that you do focus on, on your local boards and let them do the training for you in fair housing. And they will give you the real story. I hope that two minute summary uh, was something that you can use. Oh, you, Mr. Jackson, that's why I wanted you to go first. You did, the, <laughs> you did your thing. As my mama would say, I don't know if she's on the line, you put your foot in that one. Thank you, I almost got tears in my eyes. This, um, and let me, before I go to uh, Dr. Ed London, I think we ought to come out of this conference and making sure that all the realtors, every local board, is trained on how to teach their members fair housing. And that's one of the reasons why if you members you've noticed there we have there's been an uptick of making sure that most of our programs that we're trying to do more around fair housing every year. So Mr. Do I'm gonna call you Dr. Jackson. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for sharing that before we go to Dr. London. And Dr. London, uh, I know you 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 you're from Atlanta, uh, where the where the dreamer uh, live before he was uh, assassinated. Uh, we had uh, uh, the president of, of the association at that time, uh, QV Williamson, uh, testified uh, before Congress a week before Dr. King was assassinated. So I want you to kind of give us a snapshot from then and bring us up to now. Challenges, opportunities, and what role did this association play then and what role are we playing now? Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Listen, I wanna thank everybody who's on the panel today. It's quite informative what I've heard thus far. And I certainly want to uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson for guiding us through this. I, I want to go back just a little bit. Uh, Lisa and Bernie have touched on some of the things I had in mind so I don't want to be too repetitive. However, I do want to share a few more details as it relates to the historical perspective of, uh, frankly, unfair housing in this country. Goes back again, as Lisa said, to the Civil Rights Act of 1866, um, which was passed as a result of black codes that had been imposed uh, on black people throughout this country, particularly here in the South. Um, that act was uh, reenacted in 1870 after the ratification of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Um, it in fact uh, made it constitutional to violate the rights 
the civil rights of blacks and other minorities in this country, rights that were given to whites. However, by 1896, uh, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, Supreme Court case that determined, in fact, the separate but equal doctrine in public accommodations, basically uh, reestablished segregation. Uh, established segregation with respect to public accommodations in hospitals, schools, parks, and other programs. It also resulted ultimately in creation of redlining, racial restricted zoning, as well as racially restricted covenants and contracts for the sale and purchase of real estate. This, um, these dynamics continued uh, into the back the very early 30s, uh, as a result of the Great Depression, um, the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, came into existence. Uh, their predecessor, the Federal Home Loan Association, had been established to bail out basically white homeowners uh, to create programs to help them to reclaim their homes or help them to prevent being foreclosed on as a result of the market crash at that time. However, those same, very same agencies discriminated against black homeowners and potential homeowners. They created federal housing policies and bank lending practices that exacerbated the overcrowded and ghetto conditions in African-American communities, particularly in urban America. And by the time of the world, end of the World War II, when Black soldiers were coming home from fighting in this wars for this country. Uh, they faced the same conditions, even more so. There were no plans for, to provide for war housing for blacks or public housing for that matter. In fact, what happened was they created a program to create what was known as urban renewal. Basically, it was slum clearance programs that further exacerbated the problem. This is about the time that NARAP came into existence, primarily for that very reason. It was such a, a racial disparities that it was a, a home ownership disparities as a result of racial segregation and discrimination in this country. And so NARAP was founded in 1947 to address those issues. Uh, it was founded um, out of a conference that was being held by the National Negro Business League that was founded by Booker T. Washington in 1900. Booker T. Washington had founded this organization to address the many needs of black business uh, practitioners throughout the country in various areas of business, whether it be real estate, um, uh, whether it be in the areas of, um, of um, uh, medical uh, industry, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, even funeral home directors were all a part of that association. It was at, at some point in 1947, while they were meeting in Tampa, Florida, that it was the National Negro Business League was having this annual meeting in Tampa, Florida, that a group of black real estate brokers and dealers, as they were known at that time, decided to come together and form this association addressed to specific needs um, addressing uh, that is uh, focusing on housing discrimination for blacks in this country. And, and so they formed this organization. They formed it as, as a result of uh, those 12 people coming together, but also because uh, there were already existing in this country, throughout this country, local black real estate trade associations who were independent of any national organization who were attempting to address these issues in their locales. But by coming together and forming this national organization made them much more effective and strong as an organization. One of their very first tasks uh, was that of uh, an action that happened in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. It was a racial discrimination case um, known as Shelley versus Kramer. In that case, a group of real estate Brokers, members of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, spearheaded by James Thompson Bush, who was the president emeritus of the St. Louis 
Brokers Association. They were charter members of NARAB. They spearheaded that effort on behalf of their clients. And ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled, of course, that restrictive, racially restrictive covenants were a violation of constitutional provisions. And so NARAB has been fighting this fight from that very moment forward. Um, as we fast forward to the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, which established that it was outlawed separate but equal um, doctrine as it relates to public schools, became a forerunner ultimately for other enforcement provisions that broke down housing uh, segregation in, in effect. And so by 1968, has been mentioned before, the Civil Rights Act, uh, particularly Title VIII of that act, was established prohibiting discrimination based on race, color, creed, national origin in the sale, and rental, and use that is of residential properties and other facilities, related facilities. Uh, I think Lisa mentioned that act as well as many of the other acts that have been established over the years, did really not have a lot of enforcement teeth in them. And so there continue to be violations, and of course continue to be violations to this day. Because of the weakness in that particular act, uh, and the, the particular weakness in that act was um, that it provided for informal conferences, conciliation, and persuasion to get violators to do the right thing. But of course, um, such uh, informal acts failed to achieve resolution of many complaints. And there was no prop or other effective enforcement mechanism in place other than for individuals to file lawsuits, which could take years to, of course, uh, adjudicate. And so, so we find that these uh, substantial weaknesses in that um, uh, law resulted in, under Black Hood Secretary Sam Pierce, uh, resorted, that has resulted in the uh, modification of that law to uh, establish the 1988 Fair Housing Amendment Act. That act, of course, was to strengthen the enforcement provisions under Title VIII by increasing punitive damages in civil uh, actions, private civil actions in particular, and other civil actions. So, as we continue forward, um, we found there are still violations. Many suits were filed by the federal government, by state and local governments as well, for violators. Yet, violations continue, and to this day continue. We find predatory lending practices put in place, uh, which enforce that it was imposed unfair and abusive loan terms to borrowers, black borrowers in particular, charging higher interest rates, higher fees, in other terms, that strip the buyers of their equity. Predatory lenders often use these aggressive forces uh, uh, and sales tactics uh, to uh, deceive black homeowners. President Sometimes, uh, President, we want to we want to yeah. we could for one second. We can pause in one second. I'm going to get the next speaker on so that we can give you a chance to answer some questions. Okay. Is that All right. I'm going to wrap. Let me let me wrap it up. Sure. Uh, and so if we fast forward, move fast forward to today, um, we, we find that uh, as a result of the 2007-2008 Great Recession, uh, that the typical black family's median wealth has been uh, impacted substantially um, and continues to result in an increased disparity between the wealth gap between blacks and whites and other um, racial groups. And so finally, uh, we now see on the scene gentrification, uh, another um, issue, very controversial issue now that's impacting black communities and resulting in displacement of many black families. And of course, as a result of that, uh, home equity is being lost at even greater proportions than in the past. And lastly, of course, this pandemic uh, that, uh, is causing many black families to feel uh, lingering uh, impacts of the 2008 uh, recession. And even to a great extent, um, we find that black homeowners um, 
have missed or had their mortgages deferred uh, at a greater rate than others as a result of this, this virus. And this is leading, of course, to a fear of a widening of the uh, gap in home ownership disparities. And so we have great challenges. They've started uh, from the very beginning, uh, this country, and they continue to this date. And uh, just want to say that NARAP has continued to be at the forefront of fighting these issues from the very time of its uh, uh, beginning to this day. We continue to be at the forefront. And, and uh, as was said, absolutely, we are the first civil rights organization in this country to address issues related to housing, and we continue to be at the forefront. Our motto being democracy and housing. Thank you uh, very much for the time you allowed me. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna come back to you, uh, Dr. London, in a few minutes. I wanna give uh, Brian uh, Green a chance to give us a few minutes of, of, of thoughts about uh, fair housing. I know that uh, NAR put out a statement uh, uh, a few weeks ago, a second time. I know in, during, the, during uh, 2018, they made a public apology uh, just a couple months, a couple weeks ago, they did. And, you know, the interesting thing about the association that we don't talk a lot about, uh, and Mr. Mr. Jackson was so kind about it, as a student of fair housing, as someone who sponsored uh, fair housing legislation at the local level, uh, you know, one thing I was fascinated about uh, is that the, the, the week before Dr. King um, was assassinated, uh, QB Williamson, who was the 10th president of, of the association at that time, was testifying before Congress. That bill was not able to leave the Senate until after King was assassinated, because at the same time, NAR was actually lobbying aggressively at it. And there's a lot of documentation on that. But they have evolved, and uh, we're really glad that um, they've been really focused on that issue. So, Brian, welcome. I know you got a you got a big job over there at NAR. I'm, I, I guess I I, I guess I'm, I I want to one congratulate you. Unfortunately, it took all these years before they hired somebody in that spot, but at least they did it. Better late than never. And I guess this is this they were ahead of the George Floyd by a couple months. So, welcome to the welcome to the team. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. And uh, that's right. You know, I, I came on um, last year uh, in November and uh, even prior to that, uh, NAR formed a, a fair housing policy committee, a 45 member committee uh, devoted to this issue. Uh, you know, we've had other uh, iterations. Uh, you know, we, we have a separate diversity committee. Um, but the diversity committee was handling fair housing issues and we had an equal opportunity committee once upon a time. Um, and NAR uh, recognized the importance of being intentional to focus explicitly on fair housing. And, uh, you know, as, as you also point out, it's been an evolution uh, over time, um, but we are doing more and more uh, every year, every day. And, and this year uh, really has been a banner year for us on fair housing. Let me say, you know, it's great um, to be on this panel with Lisa Rice, too. She told you that uh, the two of us together are going to be spearheading um, a working group uh, to look at fair housing issues and um, uh, specifically uh, black minority, black home ownership issues and, and how we can boost that. Uh, very excited uh, to be working with Lisa. Uh, you know, both of us have devoted decades to this work. Uh, I started as a child as well. Uh, doing fair housing at HUD. And now we find uh, we're in a period in this country where we have the wind behind our back on this issue uh, and very happy to be aligned um, with the National Fair Housing Alliance and the work we're doing at NAR. Uh, you know, this year, for example, uh, NAR you know, joined National Fair Housing Alliance and others, including folks in the lending industry in calling on the Trump administration um, uh, to, to hold off on issuance of a new scaled back disparate impact rule. Uh, we argued just as uh, the National Fair Housing Alliance and uh, some lender partners that uh, this is a time where we need to be doing more to investigate uh, what the structural discrimination there may be uh, in um, both the lending industry and the housing industry and uh, not a time where we should be uh, 
suggesting that uh, further scrutiny is not warranted. So, uh, so we're making that case. Um, we also uh, are strong supporters of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule from, from the Obama administration and oppose the Trump rollbacks on that as well. And uh, we recognize the need to be more aligned with, with NAREB. Uh, we haven't been. Uh, you know, uh, we've heard uh, just now just the history, but um, even more recently, um, I've been disappointed to see that NAREB and NAREP and AREA uh, are taking a position on one side of the issue and NAR is, is speaking separately on that issue. We should be together uh, when it comes to fair housing. You know, uh, NAR is an umbrella group for uh, the whole nation. There's no reason why um, NAREB and NAREP and AREA should have to say something separate uh, from what we say. So now I'm the, the vice president of advocacy, of policy advocacy um, for all of NAR's issues. And I, I see as an important part of this role, uh, making sure um, the interests of all consumers, of all persons in the real estate profession uh, are recognized in, in our advocacy and that we, we see issues through the lens uh, of all Americans. So that's a very important part of it. And so I think that's a big part of what our president, Charlie Oppler, uh, was acknowledging in this apology, that we've been doing the work uh, and that it's a very natural uh, evolution uh, to make a formal apology uh, for the past uh, harm that our association has caused. Uh, we recognize the imprint that redlining and r racially restrictive covenants have left on our communities, uh, the lack of intergenerational wealth uh, that um, this history has caused and how it affects us today. We recognize that we still have discrimination uh, in the marketplace as Newsday illustrated, um, but we're doing more. Uh, we have, uh, we'll talk more about this Fairhaven um, program we just launched, but at fairhaven.realtor, uh, we created an innovative uh, training platform that uh, is getting favorable reviews just on how we can address the current uh, discrimination that lingers in our marketplace. But we recognize that's not all. I, I've actually said, you know, at the very minimum today, it's our responsibility to do no harm to make sure we aren't discriminating uh, actively in, you know, real estate related transactions. But we need more than that. Uh, we need to look at these structural issues. So a strong uh, federal enforcement um, program at HUD is, is key. Strong laws like, you know, disparate impact doctrine are key. But we're also looking at appraisals and, uh, how uh, African-American homes and um, whether they're in white areas or in uh, predominantly black communities, why are they being devalued? So we have a working group that's uh, trying to address that. Uh, we're looking at the fact that African-Americans are paying more in terms of property taxes, mortgage, in, mortgage interest rates, mortgage insurance, uh, even, when, even when you uh, look at other factors. So that's another area where we've got to do more. So we're, we're looking at all of these issues now at NAR, recognizing that the future depends on growing uh, the home ownership rate for all. Uh, my friend Jim Park from Araya, you know, once said, you know, the white home ownership rate can only go up so much more. You know, it's 75% or so. Uh, not everyone's going to be a homeowner. So if we want to see growth in housing, if we want to see growth in our economy, we've got to look to how we can uh, create more home ownership opportunities for people of color. So I'm glad to be part of this and thank you for having me. All right, in our next 30 minutes, uh, we're gonna um, really get into some of the questions, all right? Uh, you all given a great context uh, uh, for fair housing. And so let's really get into the, you know, the meat and potatoes, I would call it. So the first thing I wanna, I want to really have put this on the table. First and foremost, Lisa and Mr. Jackson. What is housing discrimination and why does it persist? Lisa, you just said we've been dealing with this since the founding of America. Why, what is it and why does it continue? So, you know, I think everyone should keep in mind that the United States of America, and when you look at the colonialization period in the in this nation, right, and what is now 
the USA. You know, everybody needs to remember that all of our policies were racialized. This nation was founded on a premise of racial inequity, right? So you, this, this country was founded by taking land and assets away from native peoples and transferring all of that wealth and assets to uh, white people. This nation was founded on uh, the premise that you needed slavery in order to provide a functioning economy that, that allowed this country to compete with other European nations because those other P European nations quite frankly, were engaged in slavery as well. So without slavery, uh, the founders of this nation didn't think that we can compete. So the norm for the US is racial inequality. That's what's the norm. What, what Fair Housing says is we're changing that paradigm and we're now making racial equality the norm. That's what we're trying to do. So when you're pushing to make racial equality the norm, you're fighting against the grain. And that's huge. It takes a tremendous amount of momentum and energy to do that because the inertia, as you know from, from you know, your, our chemistry classes, inertia always wins out. And the inertia is racial inequality. So we're, we're fundamentally changing our society and fundamental change is structural change. Structural change is always hard and it has to be consistent. It has to be persistent. You can never let up. That's why Frederick Douglass on his deathbed, if you'll recall, people asked him, what should we do? And he said three things, three words, agitate, agitate, agitate. Why? Because if you stop, then you go back to the default and the default mode is racial inequality. So that's why we still have discrimination so persistent today. And anytime we let up on advancing enforcement, we always, we result back, we default back to that mode of inequality. You're on mute, Antoine. Mr. Jackson, yes, I know, I, can you hear me? I, Mr. Jackson, yes. you know, before you answer the question on why it persists, I just want you to share with folks that quick story you shared with me about you, the broker that mentored you when integration was starting in Baltimore. Yeah, quick story, and it's, <laughs> it's all true. In order for them to show houses in that community, they had to show houses at night. They could not show any properties with black clients in any community in Baltimore. It had to be done at night. Plus, for them to get a sale, they had to use straw people. But let me just go back to Ms. Rice's comment, and I have to agree so heartily. If, let me go back to Civil War. Lincoln, for him to uplift America, you know, there was you know, what's called a Homestead Act of, of 1862, and that gave 270 million acres of land away to white settlers. The program put out there for them to go west, all of them were entitled to 100 and 60 acres that cost them no more than $18 to have it registered. And from that beginning, you know that act of 1862 was still on the records as of 1976 when it was terminated. But the point is from that beginning from the Civil War, which of course you know North and the South, the overwhelming point that we have in this nation is that they don't want to let it go. They got theirs for nothing, and they don't want us to get any of ours or whatever we want to put in there. But to, to look at that today, 
When that went in effect, the first blacks came in this country in 1619. Yet today, we're looking at the same basic problems that we faced in 1862, 1968, 2018, 2020. It's not going to change unless we do what we've seen sort of today. And as we have to lift our voice a little higher than it has before. There is no question. I at one time thought every time that I would go to a meeting, we would have this Mr. Jenkins from Detroit who would have this piece of paper and he would say, we need to fight for reparation. And we know what that is, that's 40 acres in the middle. Well, I had to really rethink that because I thought it was just an idea. And we have to rethink that. And I think those legislations that you are promoting at $15,000, that has to probably be extend, expanded to dramatically to, to sort of give us sort of equal footing as to what happened years ago that made all those folks wealthy and us still being enslaved. And that's where we are today. We're still enslaved while their wealth is still growing. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great points, uh, Mr. Jackson. You all are dropping some knowledge today. Thank you. Thank you. I want to go uh, next on to, uh, I want to hear Dr. London. Uh, you come from Atlanta. You've been around. Uh, I'd like to give you a chance to talk about the importance of, of advocacy since 1947 to the present. Uh, the association has when we didn't have texts, we didn't have computers, we didn't have, uh, uh, we couldn't get on certain planes, right? Folks had to make the trek to, uh, to, to Washington, D.C. And, 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 and go before Congress and, and debate and send letters and petition. Why is that uh, important to, uh, then? Why is it important now? And, and I want to give each of you, you, especially you and Lisa, then I'm come, Brian, I'm gonna come back to you on the next question. But I want you all to talk about the importance of testifying before Congress and petitioning and organizing. Why is it important to go before the federal lawmakers and your state lawmakers on a regular basis on these issues? Ms. Dr. London, and I'll come Thank to you. Thank you. Very good. Going back, uh, I guess, to the mid-60s, early 70s here in Atlanta, um, as within other cities around the country, uh, racial discrimination uh, and segregation, again, uh, resulted in, in Blacks simply not having opportunities to uh, purchase homes of their choices and neighborhoods of their choices. Here in Atlanta, Suppose to have been uh, a very progressive city with respect to a race. Um, the city officials actually established a boundary, a legal boundary that precluded or prevented blacks from buying homes in neighborhoods that uh, crossed that particular boundary. In fact, uh, they put a literally a boundary across the street street that's named Peyton Road, put a boundary, it's like a wall uh, that said uh, you cannot cross uh, this particular um, point to purchase a home or even to come into the neighborhoods. As a result of that, of course, uh, our local chapter here, the Empire Board of Realtors, its membership, its leadership, uh, filed a suit against the city to take that wall down. And ultimately the wall was removed. We found, we de determined at that point that it was very critical for us to continue to fight for equal housing opportunities uh, so that our members themselves would have an opportunity to grow their businesses as well as to advocate for black home ownership. And, and so because that, that uh, condition, similar conditions existed throughout the country, 
uh, we determined that it was necessary for us to continue not only to, to address those issues locally, but to address them nationally. And so we began to go to Washington annually or throughout the years to lobby on behalf of legislation that would protect the interests of home ownership for blacks in this country. Uh, in fact, our national office uh, um, has <clears throat> routinely and continued even to this day under your leadership, Mr. Thompson, uh, to, <clears throat> to be well informed of uh, legislation that impacts us one way or the other so that we are constantly uh, knocking on doors, walking the halls of Congress to lobby our legislators and representatives to make sure that our interests are uh, protected. To not do that, of course, would be a travesty. We would not be serving the interests of our members. So that's why it's very important for us to, to do that, that we've done it historically and we continue to do it. I'll share one other a piece of legislation uh, that uh, had a national impact. Uh, again, uh, in the mid to late 80s, uh, because as you indicated, uh, uh, during those times, uh, the internet didn't exist to the extent that it does today. Uh, but uh, there was what was known as, and still continues to be known as, um, housing opportunities for those in other communities uh, that were able to access the multiple listing services. Um, many realtor boards around the country had control of those and continue to have control of those services. But we could not access them, our members could not access them. And of course, uh, that resulted obviously in a serious uh, disparity in terms of our members being uh, exposing uh, their customers and clients to homes uh, uh, in locations in neighborhoods throughout the city. And, and so we filed a suit uh, against the multiple listing service and the local board here of realtors that uh, had control of that um, MLS um, program. In the final analysis, of course, that suit went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court out there had gone through a uh, appellate process uh, decided not to uh, consider the case, and so it was remanded back to the uh, the Court of Appeal, the Circuit Court of Appeal in the 11th District, and, and the uh, the ruling stood, that is the ruling that uh, granted us access to those services. Well, as a result of that, uh, uh, many other local boards around the country utilized that case as a precedence for getting similar rights uh, to access multiple listening services in their neighborhoods in their cities. And, and, uh, and so uh, that's the kind of, those are the kind of uh, activities that uh, we have determined and we found is critical to our success and that is in helping to uplift our communities and ensure that our uh, race of people have access to housing opportunities and to create wealth through home ownership. Thank you. Thank you. I want to go to Lisa to talk about you. you you're on Capitol Hill all the time, Lisa, uh, doing a lot of good stuff for fair housing. Why is it important uh, to, to be in front of these legislators and these regulators and these agencies and departments? Why is that so important, Lisa? Now, I think that Dr. Holden um, hit the nail on the head, right? And that is that there are so many people uh, who are our elected officials and who are working in official capacities that don't have any knowledge about fair housing. They don't understand what it is. We just saw um, examples of that right over the past four years when people in official positions were uh, making comments and statements um, trying to explain what fair housing is and they were getting it all wrong. It was clear that they didn't understand what fair housing is. And so it's important for us to continually uh, testify uh, before hearings and to uh, brief um, uh, Capitol Hill staff and, and the staff of our local uh, elected, elected officials to make sure that they understand what fair housing is and what are the fair housing issues that are really facing uh, the clients that we're all serving. The, the other thing that I'll note Antoine is that whenever we go and talk to elected officials, 
they always ask, is this really still a problem? You know, people think that we live in a post-racial society and we do not. And so they're very shocked to hear that discrimination not only exists, but it is all too common. There are over 4 million instances, 4 million instances of housing discrimination that occur each and every year. And there is no awareness of the breadth and depth of the fair housing challenges that we face. So it's important for all of us, not just realtists and fair housing advocates, but it's important for uh, uh, realtors, members of NAR, it's important for uh, industry players in other areas like lenders, uh, appraisers, et cetera, to, to talk about these issues. I was just on a, we're just having a conversation in the chat now about appraisal discrimination. I was just on an appraisal webinar yesterday, participating in a panel. And one of the most compelling presentations I've ever seen in my life on appraisal discrimination was brought by an appraisal professional. This is a senior executive working for a major lending institution. She's an African-American woman, and she has experienced appraisal discrimination herself, and she could so readily recognize it and tell such a compelling story because she's an appraiser. So we need industry players to be speaking up and to be testifying as well. Thank you. Lisa, I'm going to stay to you real quick, and I'm going to come over to you, uh, uh, Ms. Rice, Mr. Uh, Green, and uh, Mr. Jackson. Just one minute, just the importance, each of you, one minute, because we're going to, we got to get through a few more questions on uh, the importance of litigation, Lisa, because, you know, we said, yeah, you all said it, the laws didn't have any teeth until 1988. We got a little more teeth now. Why is litigation so important to get people to follow the law? So Antoine, and for, unfortunately, that's the way that it is. While HUD, DOJ, and the Prudential regulators have the responsibility for fair housing enforcement and regulation, unfortunately, they seldom are the leaders in fair housing advancement. When you look at the precedent setting cases that have been brought in fair housing and fair lending. When you look at where we've been able to really move the needle, those cases have all been brought by private fair housing organizations or private litigants. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, HUD throughout its history has taken positions that have been the antithesis of the positions taken by fair housing advocates and uh, civil rights leaders. So for example, there was a time when HUD said sexual harassment by a landlord or a maintenance uh, uh, worker, sexual harassment in housing was not covered by the Fair Housing Act. So it took my predecessor, Shauna Smith, to bring the first sexual harassment case in the courts a judge established that sexual harassment is covered. It does come under the auspices of the Fair Housing Act and that changed the, the needle. When you look at other areas uh, as well, uh, we're recently, we're right now we're litigating uh, cases involving the discriminatory maintenance and marketing of foreclosed properties as a result of the, the great recession and foreclosure crisis HUD initially took a position that said, no, you can't bring those REO cases under the Fair Housing Act. And it, it has taken our legal uh, efforts and decisions by three different judges in three different districts uh, throughout the United States to say, yes, you can bring these cases and you can bring them using disparate impact claims as well. And of course, here recently, Brian, uh, we've seen HUD, I'm sorry, Antoine, we've seen HUD take positions that really turn back the clock on fair housing when it comes to a affirmatively furthering fair housing or disparate impact, um, they've turned back the needle. So we have to have private enforcement to advance the ball and to continue to push the envelope so we get true reforms. Thank you. I wanna to go to Brian, you wanna chime in on that? Yeah, you know, enforcement 
is necessary. One, because it, it brings real life cases uh, to the forefront uh, to show people what's going on, uh, sends a message to others uh, that there are consequences. Um, and of course, you know, it gets justice for, for the people who have been injured. Um, unfortunately, you, you can't sue everybody or, or bring every case. Um, so that's another reason why policy is so important as, as well. But on the enforcement side, let me just stress that uh, NAR has advocated for more funding for federal enforcement. Uh, we're, we're actually hoping that uh, in the uh, bill that we're hoping will come out any day now from Congress, that we're going to see a major jump in funding for federal enforcement. And specifically, we want to see funding for more testing. Uh, you know, when you asked the question earlier about, uh, you know, housing discrimination and why more people don't know that it occurs today, I think a large part of it is because uh, unless you have the testing evidence, you don't know. Uh, what New York Newsday illustrated is that uh, the testers, that the people of color, often thought they were treated fine. It was only when they saw how they were treated relative to whites that they realized that they had been steered or not told about the same opportunities, you know, not provided the same listings uh, or, or, you know, subject to worse conditions. And that really is what opens up people's eyes when they see the differences in treatment. And so it's no surprise when we do surveys among the realtors, you know, a very small percentage um, have said that they've either seen discrimination or acknowledge the extent of discrimination. And it's very possible that unless they see situations side by side, they're not going to know that. And I think that's true for American people. So when we uh, advocate, you know, when we talk to members of Congress, uh, it's important uh, that people see what is happening. Realtors know it's happening because very often, uh, you're, you know, you're working with clients who face this discrimination, but a large swath of the country won't know unless they see that testing evidence, unless they see those testing cases. So that's one reason why NAR is a strong proponent of testing. Mr. Jackson, uh, we'll go to Mr. Jackson and then I'm going to do my last question, but you got to tighten it up because we only have five minutes. So we're going to go to Mr. Jackson to give a quick two minutes. Then I'm going to give you all um, one question on Biden Harris. Okay. Uh, just, yes, President I'll Jackson. Biden Harris. Your partner of justice actually has as the, as the teeth to enforce these provisions. But one big point enforcement this year, HUD's budget was cut to eliminate a lot of the enforcement. That's true. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I want to go to uh, Lisa first of uh, one minute. First 100 days of Biden Harris. What can they what should they do to advance fair housing? I'm hoping that Brian is going to talk about one particular issue. So I'm going to say reestablish the president's fair housing council and make the vice president, the new vice president, Kamala Harris the chair of the President's Fair Housing Council that brings together every single federal agency in the fight to advance fair housing. I hope I talk about the issue that Lisa thinks I'm gonna talk about. Um, <laughs> well, I think we agree uh, that there should be a, a restoration of uh, the 2015 disparate impact rule. Uh, and then we also um, believe that we should restore um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, I would actually say that it's an opportunity uh, to make the Obama era rule stronger and just just more straightforward so that we can ensure that communities comply. Uh, and then finally, uh, sort of echoing what Lisa said about uh, the President's Fair Housing Council, um, for whether, it's the fair, whether it's the Fair Housing Council or uh, the Domestic Policy Council, there needs to be coordinated um, civil rights work among agencies. Uh, we believe housing is the foundation to a lot of the other civil rights issues, um, but we also want to see there, you know, some recognition uh, that education, transportation, health, uh, uh, environmental policy, and housing all go together, and the government should be looking at these issues together. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jackson and Dr. London. Uh, first yes. 100 days of Biden, Harris, uh, Dr. London, what would you like to see them focus on for fair housing? 
I would like for them to establish an office uh, that focuses on the reparations for blacks, uh, particularly as it relates to housing reparations because of the disparities that have occurred and because of the discrimination that has resulted in, in, in uh, black home ownership and, and, and the wealth gap. Uh, that, that matter needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed uh, in a very determined manner. And so I think someone should be uh, placed in charge of an office to pursue that and pursue it aggressively. I love it. I love it. Great idea. See, that's just that's, that's what this is all about. An office to study reparation that will go good with um, uh, Congresswoman uh, Sheila Jackson Lee's bill. Uh, Mr. Jackson. Well, I would like to first say that our new core of administration meet with this HUD nominee from Cleveland, Ohio, every time we get into administration, we go, when we meet with the top officials, first thing they say, well, we haven't heard about you. So I'll make sure that they initiate a quick meeting with the new nominated HUD secretary, and we can introduce some of those old programs that really work like simple assumption. And we can help out those failing homeowners with a simple assumption that they don't do anymore that would probably be benefit us tremendously. I love it. I love it. I love it. So you all have been phenomenal. I want to give you just 30 seconds. Please don't go beyond that because we, we're we going to give us the hook. So I want to give Lisa, ladies first, 30 seconds. Any final closing comments? Thanks, Antoine. No, no, nothing except for thank you all for the solidarity. And we look forward to working with you all. Um, NAFA is not launching. We have launched a Black homeownership initiative. It's called Keys Unlock Dreams. And we hope that we can look for NARAB um, to partner with us on that new initiative. So you'll be hearing more from us about that. Thank you, Brian Green. Just wanna say, let's just keep educating people um, I just put in the chat, you know, we've got recent things that have happened, like, you know, predatory lending, you know, urban renewals not that long ago. We have to remind people of how these things have effects today and that uh, we have an obligation as a society uh, to, to make amends for it. So uh, I just want to encourage you uh, as you're talking about housing policy to, to share all of this background with people so they appreciate how it affects us today. Thank you, Mr. President Jackson. Well, a rising tide lift all boats. We have found that our boats have been burdened with the body of our ancestors. If we can look at this administration to make sure that their policies are beneficial, I think the outcome will be bright for us all. And remember, try to teach our own story. Don't let someone else teach our story to us. Amen, amen. Dr. London. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, uh, very excited about this, this, this panel. Uh, some great information has been shared with us and I would recommend that this continue, this dialogue continues. In fact, that we might want to um, establish this panel and maybe some others added to it as an ongoing uh, group, if you will, uh, to continue to study and uh, this, this, these issues and to develop strategies uh, for overcoming them. So I would, I would, I would recommend that, um, uh, Mr. E.D., that uh, some time would be set aside periodically for this group and others to, to join us to come together to continue this dialogue and pursue it uh, aggressively. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank you all. Uh, before I bring up President Williams, uh, two things. Uh, there has been an internal lobbying effort to do something annually around restoring the dream of home ownership. Mr. Williams said we're going to do something big around MLK Day, around housing. Uh, so we will be inviting you all. We're going to have a series of events. And so these are some great ideas. And every year, not just in Fair Housing Month, but during MLK week, the association needs to lead the charge to kick the year off because every year we must we must fight for fair housing. And so I want to thank you all. A lot of good ideas. We're going to turn it over to our 31st president, 
of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, Mr. Donnell Williams. You all have been phenomenal. Mr. Thompson, I, I don't think President Williams is with us, so you can go ahead and close us out and invite others to the next panel. All right, so one quick thing. Uh, before uh, we wrap up, I want to say that we've heard you. We know we have work to do. We will follow up on the issue related to meeting with the Secretary of HUD, uh, the nominee, which we planned it, was already on the, on the docket. We will do that. We love the idea about uh, Office of Reparations, uh, the Fair Housing Council, uh, the issue about affirmatively furthering fair housing, uh, getting that uh, back up, and a few of the other items. We will work with our team to support those efforts. So without further ado, there is another session at 1 p.m., right, Ms. Jill? I'm going to turn it over to you. And let's give a nice realtor's hand clap to all of our panelists. Yes, we have our next session, Realtors Nation, at one o'clock. It's social media for business. It's for beginners and advanced. Thank you, Dr. London, Mr. Jackson, Lisa Rice, and Brian Green for joining us today. This was an amazing panel, very informative. It keeps us accountable and keeps us on our game to know, know and tell our own story. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see everyone back at one o'clock.